Good morning, Covenant. And thank you, Brian. I'm happy to be with you this morning, although I'm not happy that Pastor Jeff is sick, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve God's people, not with my words, but with the word of God. You might have heard the song, uh, the title is, He is Worthy, written by Andrew Peterson and Ben Scheib. This song is packed with questions, question after question, to which the background singers answer in affirmative. A part of this lyric goes like this. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. In the second verse, it goes on asking more questions. Does the Father truly love us? Of course he does. Does the Spirit move among us? Of course he does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? I'm sure he does. Does our God intend, intend to dwell again with us? He does. Then he goes with a very crucial question. Is he worthy? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? And then he answers, of course, Jesus. In my judgment, when I listen to this great song, it matches the message of Psalm number 46. Psalm 46 is my scripture reading, and my sermon title is God is Our Refuge and Strength. So please open your Bible in the Old Testament to the book of Psalms, Psalm number 46. Someone said, Psalm 46 is a great fitting for Reformation Sunday. I tell you, today is not the Reformation Sunday. But since it's a part of the infallible, inspired word of God, I tell you something else. Psalm 46 is fitting for any Sunday, including today. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. Verse number four. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Verse number eight. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. 
He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise your name for the opportunity to read, to study, to meditate upon, and to preach your word. May you and you only be glorified among us whenever your word is read and it's heard to be loved and cherished, dragging us to come at your feet and to confess that you have given us grace to be confident in the life we live till the day we see you face to face. face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In my introduction, I will try to present you with some hints so you and I can use them as building blocks to build a house. And today we would like to name the house Psalm 46. My intention is not to give you a canvas and some brushes to draw a picture of a house. It's nice to draw a picture of a house. But it's very different from building a house. We would like to look at this psalm to be able to get into it. To build a house, to be able to go in and live our life inside it. To make a house a place to rest, to grow as a believer, to have fellowship with other redeemed ones, and to glorify the Lord who has shown who we are and has proved who he is, what he is doing, and what he will be doing in future. So the intention of sermon is not to help us when we are leaving the church, we live with some abstract ideas and data based on what I'm going to tell you in the Hebrew text, what's going on in this Psalm 46, or different interpretations, but to fall in love and to confess the same confession and to be strong in the way the Lord is giving strength to his people within the ages through this psalm in the book of Psalms, Psalm 46. Hint number one. I have two books. If you are willing to read, I can show them or you can find them on the internet. One is a biblical theological introduction to the Old Testament. The other one is a biblical theological introduction to the New Testament. Each one summarizes books of the New Testament and Old Testament. Great, great books from the Reformed perspective. In chapter 14 on Psalms, the author says, the book of Psalms opened the third division of the Hebrew canon. A division the New Testament labels as the Psalms. Among with, along with the law of Moses and the prophets, three divisions, which is mentioned in the Luke chapter 22 verse 44. The purpose of this, the writer says, the purpose of this third division is to instruct God's people in how to live out the covenant. The book of Psalms is a perfect introduction to the third division because we shall see the purpose of the book of Psalms is to instruct God's people in how to experience not drawing a picture, but building the house. How to experience the abundant life 
for which God has created and redeemed them. So this is the intention of the book of Psalms. To instruct you how to live out your faith. To instruct you how to experience the abundant life for which God has created and redeemed you. This is obvious by what the author instructs us to do in this Psalm number 46. And even more by what when God himself stands in the book of Psalms, Psalm 46, in one, one verse, God stands and he says, I, he instructs himself, he himself instructs us. Hint number two, context. We need to understand there is a context for this psalm. Uh, if you go to the commentaries by James Boyce, my beloved commentator, you will find he is talking about two possibilities to be the background of this psalm. One possibility, he says, is based on 2 Chronicles chapter 20, uh, what happened to Jehoshaphat when the armies of the east, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir were coming against him. And Jehoshaphat prayed for help. God said, they didn't need to fight. They didn't need to stand against the invading armies. Enemies fought and destroyed themselves. And when men, the Judah, men of Judah came to the place that overlooked the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies on the ground. And no one had escaped. This might be one of the backgrounds for Psalm 46, but most likely is the second one, second incident, which is in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. The Assyrian army stood against King Hezekiah. King Sennacherib sent his commander to stand before the walls of Jerusalem, calling people, Israelites, to surrender. He was boasting that none of the gods of the nations had been able to stand against the Assyrian army. He also sent a threatening letter to King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah entered the temple and spread the letter before the Lord. God talked to him through Isaiah, saying that God would defend the city, and Sennacherib would return to Nineveh and would die there. That night, the Lord of hosts sent an angel through the camp of the Assyrians, killing 185,000 soldiers. In the morning, the people of the king of Judah saw what the Lord had done the night before. And most likely, this is the background for Psalm 46. Hint number three. In the beginning of the psalm, there is a kind of introduction. It says, To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. I want to point to two critical points in this single line. Sons of Korah. Who are sons of Korah? We know based on Numbers 26, these people stood against Moses and contended against the Lord. Then the Lord, in his justice, the righteous God, opened the earth and they were, they were swallowed up together. 250 men from the tribe of Korah. But the psalm says, Psalm 46 says, all the sons of Korah, they were killed, 250. What's happening? If we go to Numbers 26, 
we realize there it says, but the sons of Korah did not die. Some of them were spared by grace of the Lord. Why? They were a part of the Levite tribe. They were selected by God to do something in the temple or in the tabernacle. The sons of Korah are telling us about covenant keeping God when he plans, when he assigns, he does it ultimately even if it's completely impossible. He kept some. He kept a remnant for the job he had assigned them to do. And when we look at Psalm 46, it is as if sons of Korah are telling us about the horrible death of their fathers and forefathers. It is as if they are glorifying God for the way he killed their fathers. And that's right. They are looking at the glory of God who is sovereign over all, even when in his justice he judged their fathers who stood against God and his ways. I guess I, as an Assyrian, I'm doing the same today. Because in the previous hint, I talked to you about the background, how 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were killed. What am I doing here? I'm Assyrian. I'm glorifying God for the way he glorified himself when in his justice he stood against sin. That way he glorified his name. This way I'm glorifying his name. Hint number four. There's another word, Alamoth. What is Alamoth? In the Hebrew language, if you, t- if you check the Hebrew text, uh, there's a word, Elam. Elam means young male, young boy. And in the Hebrew structure, if you add oath, At the end of this word, you turn the word, in this case, you turn the noun to be plural feminine. So Elam is a young boy. Elamoth is young girls, plural. So what we understand here is... It seems as if this song was arranged and composed to be sung in soprano voice with young girls. And we don't know, maybe in the future of these people, this tiny word turned to be a style of a music. But what we know is this, in the ministry of the Lord, Females have been a great role to play, specifically in worshiping, singing songs. With all these four hints, let's get into this psalm. In order to understand any passage of the scriptures, we need to find a way to make the outline, to divide it. But as far as Psalm 46, it's, Like this. Easy. Why? Because in the Hebrew text, there are markers. You can find the markers, which is not hard because it's reflected in the English translation. And that marker is one word, sila. When you find sila, you know, okay, this is bracket number two. This is bracket number one, two, and three. 
So based on the usage of this word sila, which means okay, which means yes, which means stop, to ponder, to meditate, or to be silent, maybe in some arrangements, just no singing, just the music is going on. Whatever it is, it helps us to divide this passage into three parts. Part one is from verse one till the end of verse three. Part two starts from verse four till the end of verse seven. And part three is from verse eight till the end of the chapter. The way I would like to look at these three parts is this. Part one, I'm going to talk about we have confidence in him when the material world is perishing. In the second part, I'm going to talk about we have confidence in him when we live our daily life. And the last part, we have confidence in him when we don't see the future. So part one, verses one, two, three. We have confidence in him when the material world is perishing. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Two words are used here, refuge and also a very present help in trouble. Refuge is extremely important in the Old Testament because when someone is attacking you, the only way to survive is to get into the refuge. That's the only and only way. When attacks are from without, what you need is a strong, very strong refuge to get into it. When there are problems and attacks from within, you are in trouble and you don't know what to do. No matter into which strong cold or refuge or building or castle you go, it's from within. Nothing helps but a very present help. Who is that strength? Who is that refuge? Who is that very present help in trouble? God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is our very present, immediate present help in trouble. What's the consequence? The consequence is this, we will not fear. We have the confidence. And our confidence is not in myself, my knowledge, my experience, my possession, or anything I can trust in other people. My confidence is in the God who is my refuge, in the God who is my strength, in the God who is very present help in trouble. And then, the author lists different things which is helping me to understand, listen, the material world is perishing. Nothing here is permanent. Nothing here is eternal. Nothing. And we need to trust the Lord when we understand we are living in this flesh, which is not forever here. Sometimes you and I live our life as if we are here forever. Others die, me not. A nice dream. Everything is changing. I love to study from 10 p.m. till 2, 3 a.m. That's, I'm a night guy. One night, I realized I had fallen asleep on my computer 
when I woke up, it was 2 a.m. And I said, why? It's just 2 a.m. I was so disappointed. And honestly, I told myself, oh my goodness, I'm getting old. <laughs> if you think you will stay young, you are off. If you think you will not die, you are totally wrong. If you think you will not be sick, you are wrong. This material, this earthly life is changing and going to perishing. It goes down. You have money you can trust. You have friends you can trust. You have experience you can trust. I tell you, none of them is permanent. None of them. Everything is shaking. Everything is perishing. And we should understand it. Therefore, the first stanza is telling us in this perishing world, our confidence has to be in the God who is our refuge, in the God who is our strength, in the God who is a very present help in trouble, which leads us to, okay, not to be fear. Accept the fact we will die, we will get sick, we will face so many obstacles in our earthly life, but I don't mean get upset about them. I don't mean get discouraged. I mean, tell yourself, I'm not going to fear, regardless. I'm not going to fear. I heard a statistics which says, one third of the population living on the earth, including us, one third of us here, when they die, they die in a fraction of a second. Two thirds, when they die, they have an exit. And this exit can be two days, two months, due to the physical circumstances, maybe two years. It's a duration for them. But for one third of us, no duration, it's like boom. Accept it. This is the nature of our earthly life here on earth. Can you trust it? Can you trust people? Can you trust your money? Can you trust your experience? Can you trust your goodness? Can you trust the fame you have, good name you have? Believe me, all is perishing. Don't be upset about them. Accept the fact, but instead say, I'm confident in the God who is my refuge and strength, in the God who is the very present help in trouble, and regardless of what's happening here, I will not fear because I am fixing my eyes upon him. In the second stanza, which is from verse 4 to 7, we see we can confess we have confidence in him when we live our daily life. Our daily life here. Although it is perishing. But he has put us here to live our lives. Wherever you are. Whatever you do. You are living your life in the flesh here. While you are in the flesh. You should say I have confidence in him. All the days I'm living my life, my daily life here. 
If you look at verses 4 to 7, it says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. There is a great contrast between a river and verse number 2. The earth gives way. The mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. It's water roar and foam. The mountains tremble. It's a chaos. It's a tsunami in verse number two. When it, we come to verse number four, it talks about a river. A calm, a gentle river. Whose streams make glad the city of God which defines what's the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Yeah, it's talking about Jerusalem. The city of God is Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the holy habitation of the Most High. There is a river. For ancient Israel, the source of water was the Gihon Spring that was underneath the city of Jerusalem. And it was flowing into pools such as that of Siloam in John chapter 9. So having that stream of water was guaranteed for the city whenever they were attacked, at least they could survive for a long time due to the fact that there was water there. But the water was not the raging water, was calm with the streams make glad the city. Yeah, Jerusalem didn't have a huge river. What Jerusalem had was not too deep, was not too wide, was not too obvious to people from afar. It was enough to survive. What is the city of God? Some look at it saying, this is the capital city, Jerusalem. It is a fact, God saved Jerusalem so many times. But it's also a fact that God gave Jerusalem to be destroyed. He didn't save it. Burned. At the same time, we can say, yeah, in the Old Testament, in some instances I read from Old Testament, how God saved Jerusalem. But at the same time, Jerusalem cannot be that capital city in this text. More likely is the body of Christ. God is in the midst of her. God is in the midst of her when the river is going through the city. Some commentators believe this river is the Holy Spirit or is the word of God making glad with its stream the church of God. God is in the midst of her standing in the midst and when we go to the New Testament, we see the resurrected Jesus stood in the midst of his disciple and said to them, peace be unto you. She shall not be moved. God will help, help her when morning dawns. It's very interesting what I read from the Old Testament in the Second Kings 18 and 19 is exactly what is here because when people of God in the morning they went to see what was happening in the morning they saw what God had done during the night the good news come when morning dawns. Against nations and kingdoms, he utters his voice. He stands for his own.
I can be confident, although nothing is trustable here in the flesh. Although I cannot trust anything material in this world. But I can live my daily life with him because he is the same covenant keeping God. He keeps his promises. And this is his promise. I am with you always. She shall not be moved. True believers are secured in his hands. Nothing and no one can pluck them out of his hands. They are secured. God will help them when the morning dawns. When you pray, when you wait, when you trust and nothing happens, keep trusting. Don't lose your confidence. Because if the next minute doesn't happen, if the next hour doesn't happen, if the next day doesn't happen, if the next year doesn't happen, when the morning star comes, when Jesus comes, when he comes back, it will happen. And you will see how he destroyed all those who were going to destroy you. How he cared for you. How he kept his promises for you. And when we go to the last stanza, verses 8 to 11, we see we can have confidence in him even when we don't see the future. The author of this psalm is inviting us or commanding us or ordering us saying, come, behold the works of the Lord. Could you open up your eyes? That's the message. Don't be ignorant. Look, you can see. Behold, look at his works. How he has brought desolations on the earth. Oops. Does God do it? Desolations? I tell you, of course, he does. He has done in the past. He will do it now. And he will do it according to the book of Revelation in future. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. I want us to understand where we stand. We are in a specific period of time. This is the year 2023. What happened to the Israelites when they left Egypt and God did this to Pharaoh and his armies and broke all the chariots and stood against them and killed them in the Red Sea. We were not there. What he did in the history of Israel, exactly the same thing. We were not there. We didn't see it. It's done. We cannot go back to behold and to see. We cannot. But these things will be repeated and happen again in the future. We cannot go to the future either. We cannot see what's happening in future either. But when we read the word of God, we can have confidence when we read to believe it as the Lord says it. We can have confidence in the God, our refuge and strength. The God, a very present help in trouble. Even when I do not see how his promises are accomplished. 
I don't see it at this time. But I live my life by faith and not by sight. It's very interesting. Majority of this Psalm 46, it is written in the third person as the psalmist speaks about God. He, God, he, God, all of a sudden. In verse number 10, there is a shift to the first person as the Lord speaks himself. Last night I was thinking about it to try to imagine, okay, when the psalm is, the, the content of the psalm, this is the inspired word of God, given to this sons of Korah to write it, and they're writing exactly the word of God, nothing less, nothing more. All of a sudden, it seems to me as if God says, hold on, step back, I want to talk myself directly. What he says. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. On the one hand, he's saying, hey, listen. I am the king of the nations as well as I am the king of my people. I am the king of all, ruling over all. On the other hand, he says, be still and know that I am God. There's the question. To whom he is speaking? Who is supposed to be still and know that he is God? Who is the target of God when he comes in and starts talking directly? Some believe he's talking to us, believers. He's telling us, be still. I know that I'm God. I'm ruling over all. And don't worry about anything. You are in my hands. And they bring so many biblical supports from the Old and the New Testament, which is great. Nothing wrong about it. But what if he is talking to his enemies what if he's targeting his enemies? Those who are standing against his will, his people. Because he himself is coming in and saying, be still. Be still, this word translates the Hebrew verb rafa. Rafa means to let alone, do nothing, be quiet. The form of the verb is causative. The stem is hefil, which means those who are acting must relax their efforts. Cause themselves. And we know in the New Testament, Jesus stood against so many things and rebuked them with the word and shut them off. Be still. And now what if both cases are correct? I love it. I love to take it as if he's talking to the enemies and he says, be still. And he did it. He made Saul to be quiet when he was against the church of God. He got blind. He smashed him down. And he raised him up as an apostle. He does it to his enemies. And also... It can be to us. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. God says, be still. 
Stop trusting your own. Stop trusting your works. If you have been drifted, stop. Be still. Be quiet. Know that he is God. Know that you are not alone. The God of the universe is your God. You can claim it. You can boldly confess you, God of the universe, is my refuge, my strength, my very present help in trouble. Therefore, now or tomorrow, the Lord of the hosts is with us. If you pay attention to verse number 7 and verse number 11, both are identical, which means the end of the second stanza and the end of the third stanza is the same. Why? Because in the second stanza, we look at our life, which we are living on a daily basis here on earth. And in the third one, while we are living here our daily life, we try to look at the future. Although we don't see anything happening or everything happening, we still are confident. In both cases, the Lord of hosts is with us. If I see, if I don't see. If I have it already, if I don't have it already, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The last point I would like to make is about the God of Jacob. Why the God of Jacob? We do know in the Old Testament, God has introduced himself by the name, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who keeps his promises and covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But here, why Abraham is missing, Isaac is missing, Jacob, the God of Jacob. Maybe Jacob is a little bit different, not just because of his nature. You know, the name Jacob means deceiver. I'm sorry for those people whose name was Jacob, but this is the definition of the uh, Hebrew word. Deceiver. And he was constantly deceiving. Deceiving everybody. God let him go into the wrestling and got injured for the rest of his life. And when you see him at the end of his life, he's bowing down, bowing down at his staff, which is indication of his injury. But when we go to the New Testament, we see, oh, in the New Testament, there is something very interesting. Romans 9, 10 to 12. And not only so, Paul says, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our father Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, Isaac, will serve, I'm sorry, Esau will serve Jacob. There was election. God had elected him according to his own purpose. And God kept his promise to the end. This tiny phrase. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Should take us to the life of Jacob and see how God has been faithful to Jacob, the deceiver. He's the same God. To you and me. In the beginning of my sermon, I encourage you to build a house. Because if we fail to live by faith, 
then our knowledge of God and his promises are nothing but some academic data. The greatest work of Luther, Martin Luther, was to accomplish the translation of the New Testament into the language of his people. But then he started writing hymns and gospel songs. The song for which Luther always is remembered is, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It was written in about 1527. This hymn is known as a paraphrase to Psalm 46. According to some historians, this hymn, we're going to sing it after my son, has been sung by persecuted people on their way to exile and by martyrs at their death. And also it is said that Luther, when in greatest distress, used to say to his colleague, let us sing the 46th song, and then let the devil do his worst. Let us build the house, Psalm 46. Let us get into it. Stay there. Live our lives under the covenant and promises of God to his children. You can be confident, although everything is perishing. You can be confident in him when you, li when you live your life, daily life, now, here. And you can be confident in him, even though you cannot see the future. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise your name for your beautiful word. How precious is your word. We ask you to continue opening up our minds to understand it better and better. And give us grace. To be confident in you, believing in you, and acting upon what you say and what you do. May your name be glorified when you accomplish all your wills in this world, the world to come, and in our personal life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.